Hello, I'm Bernard Rieke and in this short video I'd like to talk a bit more about how to remember all the different research approaches and experimental paradigms. In particular, I'd like to go over different experimental designs and discuss when to use which, what are the different pros and cons of the different approaches. So in the second part of this short video series, I'd like to focus specifically on experimental designs different ones that are most typically used in quantitative research. And these were done in as part of a research methods course that I've been teaching over many years. So thanks a lot for all the students who contributed a lot to these different guidelines that I will show here. So the first experimental design I'd like to discuss is the repeated measures design, also known as within subject design, because the experimental design is within subject, meaning that each participant or subject is exposed to all the different conditions in typically a randomized counterbalanced order, whatever works best in your case. So this is really a great option if there's no problem exposing one part or each participant to all the different conditions that you have. So this can help to reduce the amount of participants you need, for example. So whenever it's sensible to use with instructed design, it can be really your best choice. It gives you the most power and you don't need as many participants because each participant is part of all the different conditions. However, there's a lot of things to consider for with instructed designs. A key aspect is carryover effects. So whenever there's anything that could carry over a bleed from one condition to the next, then it's not really feasible to use th that uh, experimental design or at least you need to be super cautious and this can be simple things like okay if you run a virtual reality study then people might get sick in one condition and the amount of sickness might transfer to the other or if you learn something that affects your performance in the next one or if you want to basically expose people to whatever the taste of something they have never tasted like a gummy bear for example you can only do that once because afterwards, well, you've tasted it already, so you're not the same person in the sense anymore, so there is some transfer. So basically the order of the conditions matter, so the conditions must be reversible. And another challenge can be if you have multiple conditions, the whole experiment itself for each participant can be a bit lengthy. So fatigue, boredom, these kind of things can also be a bit of a challenge. So. How can you try and avoid this? Well, the most important thing is really being aware of carryover effects and being super cautious. And the other aspect is, of course, well, you need to counterbalance the different conditions, randomize it uh, if you cannot fully counterbalance, use a Latin square design, these kind of uh, things. Sometimes it can be useful to have breaks between the different conditions, especially if there's like short term effects. For example, you're exhausted or you get motion sick, these kind of things. So whenever it's feasible to have one participant, each participant be exposed all the, to all the different conditions and there's no uh, uh, strong carryover effects or anything like that, then uh, this is a great method to use. The other key method that's often used is uh, independent measures, also known as between me measures or between subject design. So the idea is basically if, if you, let's say you have two different conditions, A and B, then you split your group of participants into two different groups. You should obviously be careful to split them equally. You might want to counterbalance things that you might be aware have an effect, for example, age or gender or prior knowledge, all these kind of things. So this can be a great experimental design if you just want to keep it simple, if you have enough participants to distribute amongst all the different conditions, or if each condition just takes a whole lot of time so the participant might just get tired or exhausted. And there's a lot of different ways you could do this, like a simple one might just be a two group independent measures design where you have two different participant groups and they undergo a treatment under control and then you measure something. You could of course do the same thing with a pre-post intervention paradigm or something more complex like the Solomon four group experimental design. And of course, 
between subject design is not uh, without its uh, challenges. So for example, you might have to just have a lot of different participants, which might end up uh, being a bit of a scheduling nightmare. It might be quite expensive if you have to pay all these participants. And it can be a real issue if the between subject variability is really high. So if you have huge differences between different people, for example, based on their familiarity, prior background and these kind of things that can make it really hard because then if you just accidentally have s different participants group that operate that show different data then this can really be a, a bit of a challenge to the internal validity of the study if you don't manage to have equal participants groups so what you can of course try and is to stratify your participants group. So basically make sure that you have similar amounts of, let's say males and females or older and younger people or whatever useful categories you might have in the different participants group. Still make sure it's randomized because it's so easy to accidentally impose any kind of bias by the way you attribute, you assign the different participants groups. So make sure to really randomly allocate the different people to the different participant groups just to prevent yourself from accidentally putting some people more to one condition that you maybe hope will have a higher effect and ideally also double blind it especially if it's a something really critical or if it's a medical treatment no treatment condition it's really important that the experimenter doesn't really know who does what who and who gets what condition and finally, it's often recommended that if you can run it with uh, subject or repeated measures design, it might be more powerful in terms of getting you an effect. And of course, there's also a way to combine the different methods, often called mixed design. So basically, that's when one of some of your factors are within, some are between subject. And so, for example, so a very simple one would be you have a pre post intervention design for a treatment. So, you have the within subject uh, factor would be pre or post or different timelines, for example, between subject factor could be treatment with this placebo. And this can become arbitrarily complex. So, ideally, what you try and do in mixed designs is to combine the advantages of the different methods and try to circumvent some of the uh, possible drawbacks so for example if you have a clear carry over effect in one one variable then you might need to make this one a between subject variable but others can still be within subject variable keep in mind mixed designs can be a bit more complex to think about and also to analyze so because these are kind of the most uh, two most common ones i want to discuss some of the pros and cons of the different approaches and here just discuss basically the possible advantages and disadvantages of within subject designs and then the between subject design is basically just the opposite. So what are some of the advantages of repeated measures design? Well, one sometimes huge advantage is that you need less participants because each participant goes through all the different conditions. So this can be really useful if it's hard to get participants or uh, some other challenges that you have or it's hard to find the right participants or you have limited amount of time but each individual study doesn't really take that long then this can be a good approach so this is also a nice approach if you want to investigate how people change during treatment for example for a more longitudinal study if you investigate how things change over time depending on various factors. So for that, within subject design, it's obviously a good choice. So within subject designs can also be really useful if you have huge differences between the different people. Because in a way, people are their own baseline. You compare people to themselves, not to each other. So if there's huge differences in performance in whatever you measure between participants, then this can be a great method to use. So within subject designs, by definition, are less likely to be affected by participant differences. So often they result in higher power, so you're more likely to find an effect with the same amount of conditions. So, and that's basically because the different scores within subjects are less variable than the original scores. And of course, there's also some disadvantages. 
most obviously you really cannot use uh, or should not use within subject designs if there's some kind of irreversible impact from one condition to the other so this could be a carry over effect or effect so for example people get fatigued they might practice something that's related to skill learning you cannot unlearn the skill if there's an effect of time of day if there's any kind of lear uh, learning if there's leaking uh, like a drug might still be in the system and so on this doesn't work or for example if people get motion sick and virtual reality then it, this can be a huge uh, factor so of course if you counterbalance it you can still include this as a factor and analyze it and see how big this effect is but if there's something irreversible or if it's like a one-shot learning or there you, you learn something that really affects your performance in the next uh, condition then this really needs to be taken into consideration. So people obviously counterbalance for these kind of effects. And one of the things that you can do is then, uh, if there's just too many carryover effects, or if you cannot control for them and for all the confounds that these might pose, then just use an independent between subject design or sometimes match sample design can also be an option. So the final experimental design I wanted to discuss, at least briefly, is single subject design, or sometimes known as state, steady state methodologies. Although they might be less common, they can sometimes be very useful. So especially if you have a very unique phenomenon that doesn't really occur very often, or you have only this one participant with a, that specific condition because it's very rare or there's an accident that happens. So in the medical field, a lot of research uh, has happened with very specific instances, brain damages, and so on, that of course you cannot induce in people, but if you happen to have a patient with a very s specific condition, this can really be a great way to assess this. More generally, if there's something very specific or unique about a specific case, that can be a good method, or if you really just want to do a deep dive into one specific case can also be useful if you just want to reduce unwanted sources of variation. So in a very simple design, you might just have one intervention basically and see how that affects the result. Or you can use more complex design like multiple baseline designs where you measure whatever you're measuring multiple times before the intervention. And this can really help to improve the reliability of single subject designs. You can also use irregular intervals to avoid any kind of specific weird things happening or applying uh, same treatment multiple times. Now, this can be a really powerful methodology for uh, specific cases. Of course, one of the challenges that the results are not generalizable easily to other people, other situations and so on. You did not randomly select the participant. Typically, it's when you have a specific participant or case that you can study. So it can be a great methodology for very specific cases.